I'm here with John Nimick. We're at Grand Central Terminal 2023. John, um, an interesting background for you. Originally hardball player, playing some international hardball and then moving into what you would call over here softball. We know it is squash internationally. What, what, what took you into the, into the fold to start to look to promote uh, squash tournaments, particularly here in the United States? Well, I'm, I'm really fortunate, Joey. I, my, my career is my hobby, is my sporting passion. They're all linked together. I've taken a few detours in time, but I'm, I'm totally a squash guy. And that started when I was a kid, played hardball back um, in the Philadelphia area. Went to college at Princeton, which is an Ivy League school, and we had a great team, and we won the national championships. And at that time, in the late 70s, early 80s, hardball squash, the pro tour of hardball squash over here was flourishing. So I turned pro and played for 10 years. Uh, but at, during that time, the, the, there was also a growing awareness in the United States that the, that the true future of the sport here would be the international game. So over time, we realized that our pro hardball tour was really gonna lose ground to the international squash tour, which was called ISPA, International Squash Players Association at the time. We merged those two organizations in 1992. We created PSA, Professional Squash Association, conveniently right around when I decided I couldn't play pro squash anymore, and I was fortunate to become executive director of the PSA, and that set my pathway as a career trying to be an entrepreneur and a businessman in sport. So it's been now 25 years that you've uh, had this prestigious tournament here. Um, give us a little bit of a history on the event. So when you when you uh, finished with the PSA, um, you then started your events company, mm -hmm. and you pretty much straight into, uh, you didn't start small, you kind of built it you know, straight away. Did you build it up, or did you start with a few smaller tournaments and then go in? I started with the Tournament of Champions. Yeah. So as I decided that I was going to leave uh, the position with the PSA, I said to the PSA, I'd been running the Tournament of Champions since 92, why don't I take it as a little bit of an exit package from my role, and I'll guarantee the PSA that I'll run this event at the highest level for the next three years at least. Three years, yeah. So I started my event engine at the time, marketing company, with the Tournament of Champions as the principal asset, or, or at that time, least relationship event. And I knew that the Tournament of Champions had a lot of value. It was the first event to bring over here hardball and softball players together. It created its reputation right away. Jancher Khan won it um, twice. Rod Isles won it once. And then in 1995, somebody said, go up and see this big space that's empty in Grand Central Terminal, which was Vanderbilt Hall at the time. And this was late 94. I took one look at this room that we're about to see, and I said, this is the world's best venue for a squash championship. That's extraordinary. I mean, this, this venue, um, as we've done kind of tours behind the scenes before, you've got a massive uh, commuter belt that comes straight into the main, main concourse. John, just uh, like, I get the figures now on a, on, a, on a daily commute between Monday and Friday. How many people roughly are coming through this main uh, concourse area and seeing squash from the front wall where they can actually watch for free? It's always been a, it's always been a great attribute of the tournament that we've kept this front wall always open and free. The answer to the question is 22,000 people. 22,000 people transit this passageway every day wow. during a commuter day. Sure. So over the course of eight or nine days here, we're north of 200,000 people actually get to spectate and see Squash Live, or at least understand the sport is as valuable and vibrant as tennis or golf. And with, with the way that you approach this from the marketing point of view, of course, there's a, a massive squash playing community within uh, on the East Coast, particularly, but particularly in New York. But you're selling it not only to squash uh, squash fans, but also people from the outside. Is that uh, from the commercial side? Are you selling it as a as a general sporting event? Uh, you know, I would say most of our marketing is oriented towards the squash community. Right. Squash demographics are affluent, high end, well educated. It's a it's a rare demographic that you can deliver to a sponsor. So internally, we're selling the, the fact that there are, you know, we'll have 10,000 squash players come, ticketed squash players come through here. What the, what the passageway traffic and the grandeur of the room and the building does is it makes our sponsors excited to bring their clients for entertainment. 
So they're not going to a basketball gym or a convention center or something. They're, they're coming here to the one of the world's greatest buildings. It's the greatest transportation hub in New York City. You could come entertain a client for an hour, hour and a half, and it only takes two hours of the client's time. You can't go to a golf tournament or a tennis tournament and have that kind of compact value, but we deliver it here. So there kind of is a mix of how we sell the value proposition. That's what I wanted to ask you as well, because of the different sessions, other tournaments have, uh, they split them into two throughout the day if you have eight matches. So you divide that up into, is it two match sessions that you provide or is it three, depending on the schedule? How do you divide the, the, the days up? And, and just talk us through that a little bit. Well, it's a good it's a good specific question because we used to do exactly as you said, which is a session, a day would be eight matches. We'd have a day session for four and a night session for four. But our audience wouldn't stay for the fourth match. And sometimes they wouldn't stay all the way through the third match, not because the squash wasn't great, just because when you're asking somebody to commit time, two hours, two and a half hours is about what people expect from a sporting event. In our country over here, American baseball is having problems because American baseball games are four hours long or four hours and 15 minute long. People really appreciate having a more condensed opportunity to view. And with respect to the World Cup that has just ended, it really, I think, opened the eyeballs of a tremendous number of Americans who don't know anything about soccer to say, this is the right sport. This That game only took two hours, you know, from yep. start to finish. Yep. So, we divided up our days into four two-hour blocks, basically, or two-and-a-half-hour blocks, and we sell it that way. And if you want to come for five hours, we sell you a ticket for five hours. What's the capacity as we as we come into, into the glass court? Uh, this is your, you, your company owns this glass court. This is yours. You're not renting it from another company, which obviously helps with maintenance and consistency of the court. But what, um, what's the capacity here? Take away the front wall, which you can never give an estimate, but I've seen it at times 10 deep. Take that away. But in terms of the actual stadium uh, capacity, what is it here? We have, we have 425 sellable seats, and we have access points for probably another 25 people, standing room or uh, ADA. So we're at about 450. Yep. Uh, we're, this TOC, we're selling 23 sessions of play. We're going to sell out 12 to 13 of those sessions, which is which is better than usual. Um, sometimes, you know, the day sessions are a little lighter than the afternoon and evening sessions. But uh, we will put through about 9,000 ticketed customers over the course of those 23 sessions. Um, and we can't get any bigger. Yeah. Like, we can't get any bigger. We often talk about the fact that if for the semis and finals, we could probably sell 1,000 or 1,500 sure. seats. I think you could, yeah. But on the other hand, it pushes people to come earlier. And I think with all respect, one of, the, one of the things that pro players like best about the Tournament of Champions is whether you're in the first round or the semis, the audience is here for you. Sure. The place is packed and rocking. And so even a world number 48, if he's playing a world number 15, feels like they're on the grand stage. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And just looking ahead, I'm going to get you on this one. There's no way you're getting away from me on this one. Um, the, the American, particularly on the women's uh, tour, are doing superbly well, getting into the uh, final against Egypt over in Cairo with the, with the Sobe sisters, Olivia Fichter, who sadly lost out to Noronga. Oh, great match, though. I'm going to put you on the spot. Who's uh, from the women's first? Who do you think is going to take this, this title? Who do I think, which American will take the title no, first? Uh, well, I mean, if you think Amanda Sobey's going to win, that's fantastic. Have you just said that? Or who's yeah. going to win the tournament? Now you're under pressure. I'm not going to answer who's going to win the tournament. The one thing I do feel very strongly about, about our women's situation is it's pulling the whole women's squash environment up in the U.S. So I think the next, the champion of this event is, is coming up the pipeline. Sure. Not yeah. that Amanda can't win it, or yeah. Olivia Fichter, or Olivia Klein, um, or Sabrina Sobey. Not that they can't win it. But what's great about American squash is it's become, in, on the women's side, it's becoming a little bit like Egypt. Like, there's a long tail yeah, yeah, on the yeah. comet of great young girls who are coming up. So why, why, why is that not replicated in the men? I think that we haven't yet had a male player reach the heights that Amanda Sobey has. There's no question she has galvanized the whole junior girls community. Um, I think the men's game is harder and uh, harder to, to move through in lockstep. The women still have, I think, a little capacity for an excellent athlete to move quicker through the rankings than the men. And that makes sense, right? The men's rank world rankings are 
1,100 deep, and the women's world rankings are 700 deep. So uh, I think I think I think the men will get there, but again, I think we're probably another 10 years away from having an American male really knock on the top four spots. Yeah. Well, it's. Uh it's brilliant what's happening on the international scene. It's fantastic that this tournament's been going for such a such a long period of time and as successful as as it ever has been. Um, thank you for not answering the predictions. I can understand that Can't you're that. in a compromised position, <laughs> John. But uh, no, it's it's uh, it's always a pleasure to come here, and we're really excited for this tournament as it progresses into the the latter rounds. Particularly, uh, we'll be on Squash TV from the early stages today throughout the week, finishing on Thursday evening here in New York. But John, always a pleasure. Thank you very John. much. Enjoy, I hope you get time to enjoy this event that you I, I'm uh, put looking on forward so well. to today. I mean, I feel like we're now at the point where we can enjoy the matches and we've got incredible matchups. You're seeing Miguel Rodriguez here practice. What an incredible upset over El Shirbagi and- You always get them here. You always get them here. You always get them here. So uh, tremendous stuff. Well, join us on Squash TV and uh, we're looking forward to all the squash in the men's and women's event here at the TOC.